second. And now let's go ahead and share a screen. So in the formal definition of a derivative that we have right here, um, we had the limit. Do you guys remember what it was? The limit as, there's a certain letter we always use. It's H. You have H goes to zero of f of x plus h, meaning you have some place on the graph, f of x, and you have some place h. You know, a simple little idea was you have something, some curve like this, and this is x comma f of x. This point over here is x plus h comma f of x plus h. And if you try to find the slope of the line between those two, that's called the secant line. We talked about that. But if you drag h to zero, what's going to happen is this point right here is going to pull this way and get closer and closer like a magnet to this one, right? Now, is it ever going to touch that point? That limit as h goes to zero means you can get infinitely close, but we're never going to make it, right? And so this is the rise, y2 minus y1. What is x2 minus x1? What happens when you do the run? What is x plus h take away x? Well, that would just be h. Now, this is a great version of a line. This allows me to find the slope of the line literally anywhere on the curve. You guys okay with that? Now, there was the alternate version that looks like this over here. And that was the limit as x goes to c. Now, this is kind of strange, so just take it for what it is. Notice it doesn't say h. It's, so instead of making the separation go, it was f of x minus f of c all over x minus c. Now, this was called the alternative form. This one was more powerful because it literally told me the slope anywhere. Whereas this one told me the slope of the line where? At one exact place, which is called C. Now, as it turns out, this one is usually a faster derivative, and this is really good to use if you need one answer. If somebody says, hey, what's the slope at four? Money. I would go here every time. But if part A says, let's find the slope at four, then let's find the slope at negative two. And then when is the slope going to be 16? Uh, forget this one. I'm going to go over here. So we have three versions I want you to know. One of them is about polynomials. Okay. Now, hopefully you guys remember what a polynomial is. It is anything that looks like uh, 2x squared minus 3x plus 7. It's x cubed minus 8x squared plus 4x minus 3. I would die if you asked me to do this question the long way. It would take me forever. I don't want to do this one. It would be really long. But what you're going to notice is a polynomial has many little pieces, right? And look at the exponents. They're nice. You see that? They're like ones and twos and zeros and happy values. No fractions in there, nothing like that. So now one of the cool things is, and, and, and a couple of you seem to have missed that point, but if you were doing this limit like this, according to the rules that we had of limits back a couple of weeks ago, you could have found, if somebody asked you to do, say, this problem right here, you could have found the limit on that one by itself. Then you could pause. You could go somewhere else, and you could find the limit of that one all by itself. And then what? The last one all by itself. Now, if you break it down, remember a derivative is a slope, right? What's the orange guy going to contribute to the slope if you did it by itself? The slope of a horizontal line is zero. Hey, guess what that one's going to contribute itself? It's going to be negative three, isn't it? That piece is always going to contribute a minus three to that answer because its slope is negative three all the time, right? No matter where x is. But how about 2x squared? Is that always going to have a slope of something? Because what does it look like? It's a curve, so it's going to change over time. So we should know. So let's go ahead and take a look at this problem right here. Let's take a look at 2x squared minus 3x plus 7. And 
I'm going to try to hit a couple of things all at once just to make good use of our time. So let's first off, let's find a rock. Okay. Now I hope you guys remember what the whole a rock thing is that a rock stood for average rate of change. Now the difference is I'm basically going to do this argument, but what am I not going to bother to put in front? I'm not going to bother to put the limit. So let's take, here is f of x plus h. So I'm going to rewrite function f. I personally like to put it in a brace, something that looks like that, because I sometimes get a little bit messed up when I have too much going on. Do you guys see how that is f of x plus h? I took all of the x's out, and what went into all of those little places where x used to be, f of x plus h. Now, we're supposed to subtract, according to this formula, I am supposed to subtract the original problem. Yuck. All over H. Now, historically, I know some people say calculus is really super hard. Well, you know what? This is really not even a math analysis question. It's a bad algebra two question, isn't it? you have to distribute that dumb thing out. And what happens if you make a mistake anywhere in your distribution? You suck, right? And it, it's a bummer. But that's what kind of why I call it sometimes calculus, I call it like algebra four. They just skipped three, just went straight to four, just made it really kind of long, hard problems. And it does take some stick to it -iveness. That's a real word, by the way. It just takes some tenacity to just kind of bear down and say, oh, you're not gonna beat me. I'm gonna get this thing. So. Let's see what we got. I got two. When I square x plus h, that's what I get. And I know some of you guys probably are very good at squaring x plus h. Some of you might not remember that little trick, but I did the full distributive property on it. I've got a negative 3x, a negative 3h, and a 7. I watched my video back and I realized, hmm, now I know what people are saying. I do talk really fast. So I'm trying to force myself to slow down. Okay, what happens when I distribute the negative one over here is I get that. What happened to three X, negative or positive? Really watch that. That's one of the things that's gonna get us. And how about the seven? You can see how a student coming into calculus might look at that and feel kind of sad. You see all that, those steps? Woo. And you only have to be perfect on every one of them. That's all. It's pretty low bar. Okay, so do you see anything that makes you smile, that tells you I am doing well? Oh, I see the negative 3x here and the positive 3x there. That is a good thing. Sevens are gone. I see the 2x squared here with the negative 2x squared there. That's good. So now, what tells me I'm doing okay is every single piece that remains in my problem has what in it? Yay. That means I can divide that H in the bottom out because it's technically a common factor. So I'm just going to write it this way, um, even though it's a little slower, but you see I had a 4XH, so I have a 4XH. You see it? Then I had a 2H squared, so I'm just going to write 2H. And I had a negative 3h right there, all over h. Now, again, I'm still doing a rock, right? Now, what is that for all intents and purposes? As long as I don't allow h to be identically 0, what is my final answer is 4x, 2h, minus 3. Are you guys OK with that process? Now again, bad. Did, does this scare people a little bit if you had to do this for a test and you had time limits? Yes, I understand that. But the fact that all of these things cancel out, it's sort of like having an answer key sitting in front of you. You know if you're doing well if those things happen. I love that. Okay, moving on. Now, looking back to my picture, what could X be? X could be anything, right? And H, from my picture represented how far I moved over, right? So let's just make sure we've got it. So I want to 
Let's go ahead and call this part A. I'm going to call B. Let's find the slope on the interval negative 1 to 3. Okay? I want you guys to make sure that everybody in here understands what's happening. If I said I want to find the slope on the interval from negative 1 to 3, what am I calling x? x would be negative 1. And no, I'm not calling h 3. H says, how far have I moved over? What would that be in this case? It would be four. So I can find the slope of any secant on this curve, any slope between two points, which is pretty stinking cool. So if we did that, this would be a slope of four, two of those minus three. I've got negative, uh, let's see, I guess put those together. Eight minus four is four minus three is, oh, that was pretty bad, pretty good. Simple little idea. Slope of what? You guys cool with that? Now, let's find this. C, what is F prime of X? Now, F prime of X is the mathematical shorthand that Leibniz came up with, which is why everybody thought he was a genius. Newton had a different notation, so they thought he was like crazy, even though he actually figured the same math out. This is IROC. So what's the difference of AROC and IROC is we go ahead and we take the limit as H approaches zero of my other problem. Now, I will tell you most teachers would make you do IROC from, from the get-go. My teacher did too. I just get tired of writing limit as h goes to zero over and over and over and over again. And so sometimes I do a rock off to the side and then I do i rock. So what's my final answer? 4x minus 3. So before I carry on, I want you to look back at the original problem. 4x minus 3. You got that slope? Look above. 4x minus 3, is there anything there that seems to validate what you thought? Where's that minus 3 coming from? Hmm. How about the little pink guy, right? Now, there's a little pattern that I want you to notice, too. That would tell you that the, if I color-coded this, so I think everybody understands that the minus 3 was connected to the negative 3x in the original curve, correct? And then I did that one, other one in yellow. So that would mean by just, by extension, I guess that means this 4x that is sitting right here. My goodness, I got to zoom out more. This 4x that is sitting here seems to be connected to this 2x squared right there. And what happened to the 7? Why did it not lend itself like, hey, don't forget about me? By the way, from math analysis, what did the 7 do? The 7 moved the curve up and down, didn't it? Did it change its slope? No, it just changed like, like how high it was. So zero impact. Now, hmm, is there a pattern that makes 2x squared into 4x? We'll actually have to see that one. Now, here we go. Here's part B. I want to find the equation of the tangent line at x equals, um, let's go ahead and go with a fairly nice number. So we're going to find the equation of the tangent line at the point. Uh, I'm going to go with x equals, well, you know what? We did a pretty nice one a little bit ago. Let's do the, the, the slope of the number. Um, I'm just going to go with the number 1, OK? Very simple little idea. Now, guys, from last year, something that I tried to stress with you a lot, what was, the, what, was the, what was the glorious form of the line? Like the one that the angels sing and everybody like goes, oh, yay. Oh. What's the best one? No, what form of a line? Point slope, of course, right? So if somebody says, can you find the tangent line? Anytime you hear me say line, you should be like, oh, yeah, point slope. Because it's amazing. What is the derivative supposed to be giving you? The slope. Da, da, da. 
So if I want to come up with the equation of the tangent line, I really got too close to the bottom of this paper, but it's going to be okay. Can you guys tell me what f prime of 1 would be? So in other words, if I plugged 1 into my slope right here, would you guys buy that I got the number 1? So I have a slope of 1. That's this. Now, interestingly enough, I need a point, right? That point needs to come from the original curve. So the question is, if I were to go all the way back to the beginning of this problem, what is the point at x equals 1? Now, it was just ironically, just simple math that this was the same number. That's not always the case. But let's find out what point that was. So right up here, what is f of 1? Let's see if we can figure that out real quick. F of 1 would be 2 minus 3 plus 7 is 6. In other words, if I plugged in the point 1, I would get 6. You guys cool with that? So do I now have a point on the curve? And I have a slope that matches that point on the curve. So I have y minus 6, and I had x minus 1. Now, let's take a quick look at what this actually looks like. So it's going to take me one moment to get us to that place because I am learning what makes Desmos and everything go south on me. And so we are going to go ahead and stop the share and we're going to do a new share to Desmos. And here's what we've got. We have now found that if we take the equation 2x squared minus 3x plus 7, and we found our coordinate out there, which was the coordinate, I believe we said it was 1, 6, right? So I got this nice little point 1, 6. You got it? Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. Hopefully you guys at home can see it. And so now I came up with an equation that was y minus 6 equals 1 times x minus 1. Now, what do you see happen when you look at the two things? Does it hit that point? Not only does it hit the point, but the line and the curve now have identical slopes. Literally, if you looked at this neighborhood right here, you cannot tell the difference between the curve and the line, right? If you were sitting right in here, zoomed in really tight, can you even see the difference between the two of them? And that's actually what they do sometimes. They will do what's called linearization. They will take a curve and say, you know what? Let's make the curve into a line. Now, if I move over, will it be a different line? Sure. So they stitch together a whole bunch of lines. By the way, that's what Boeing does. When they design a plane, in a computer and try to then figure out how that's going to work, the easiest thing to make is lines. So they just make a butt ton of lines and they make them continuous and they make them all work. It actually works out all right. And uh, so that's actually a pretty normal thing to happen. Now, are you guys okay with that first example? Kind of threw out a bunch, but hopefully that's okay. Now, anybody think you might notice anything that would make 2x squared into 4x? Any ideas? stop that share. Let's, uh, any ideas out there? By the way, if you look back a little bit, we had an x cubed last time. I did one of those. I was kind of sucky. It was long and it turned into some kind of an x squared. Hmm. So what do you think an x to the fourth is going to be? Some kind of an x cubed. Yeah. What is an x to the fifth going to be? Ugh. X to the fourth. So what happens every single time, if you have done it right, each independent piece should have its exponent drop by precisely one. That's helpful, isn't it? So if you look at a problem, you should know. And by the way, yes, that actually did happen in our problem. Because if you actually look back at this problem, what was the exponent on pink right there? It was a one. And what happens if you drop it one degree, it goes to a zero. That's true. That actually does happen. There's a little bit more to that story, but that's polynomials. Okay, now let's take a look at rationals. 
Now, rationals are a little bit more of a pain in the butt. The, the trick on rationals has to do with our friend, the fraction buster, okay? The fraction buster, because by design, when we do this, we're gonna have some nasty fractions that happen. So I'm gonna start with a problem that should not be overly egregious. It's just a simple guy like this. Now, could I ask for the slope at the number three? No, so somehow the slope, if I did my problem right, I should see that the slope is not defined at three in some way. Now, just as a hint, if I were to think of this from one of the ways we discussed it back in math analysis, this would be four uh, and x minus three to the minus one power. So if you were thinking of this as a minus one power and the trick, the, the, the idea that you came up with a little bit ago, that it seems to drop the exponent by precisely one, what exponent do you think might show up in our problem when we're all done? a negative two, which means we should have something squared in the bottom if our educated guess pans out. Let's see. So I'm gonna go right to it. Let's go limit as h goes to zero. I'm gonna go g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. The polynomials I never liked in high school, but I hated these more. Do you see how bad that looks? Now, I was actually kinder than you may realize um, to you in this because my fraction buster, yeah, it's a little ugly, but it's not too bad. So what do I want to multiply across the numerator to make it a little better? I need an x plus h minus 3. Is that enough? I need an x minus three as well. Now, the theory, and this is something I tried to stress with you guys last year um, a lot, is that this whole strategy had nothing to do with the denominator. It had to do with simplifying the numerator, didn't it? And so one of the, the things that I tried to encourage you to do last year is if that was the principle, is that we would just go ahead and leave the denominator completely alone because it was kind of what I called collateral damage last year. <clears throat> so what's going to happen on the top? Now let's be really, really cautious because I technically should have a big brace around this whole thing to show that it's a big distributive property. Remember that. What happens when these two things tangle? Don't the x plus h minus threes cancel entirely? So what's the only thing I really need to multiply is the four and, so that'd be four X minus 12. Are you guys all right with that? Now be really, really cautious about this because this little minus sign right here is what causes lots of trouble. Because now when I do that, these are gonna cancel. So be careful, what am I gonna have? I'm gonna have a negative four X, a negative four H and a positive 12. Okay, so let's see that. I've got a negative 4x, I've got a negative 4h, I've got a positive 12. Now, promises made, let's see if we kept them. Anything good happen? The 4x's, bye-bye. 12's, bye-bye. And so it appears that the only thing left on top is negative 4h, isn't it? And why is that such a convenient thing for me right now? Is that H? I mean, I could say factor it, but literally it's the only thing left. So there's really no point in even factoring it. So I want to figure out what is the limit as H goes to zero of negative four over X plus H minus three and X minus three. Now, did you notice I just canceled the H out? because I'm really not allowing H to be zero, I'm just getting infinitely close to it. So, huh, what does that mean then? What does it mean? Hmm. As H goes to zero, what is this piece right here getting close to? That's X minus three, what is that? Oh, so it looks to me like G prime of X, 
that's the derivative of function g, would be negative 4 over x minus 3. Now, what was the, our little educated guess that should have happened? Because I had a negative 1 power before. Do I see the negative 2 power right now since there's an x squared? And the, so are you guys liking our trick? Is that kind of fleshing out a little bit? By the way, Newton figured this out a long time ago. That is not just an idea. That 100% is the truth. Exponents on a derivative always drop by exactly one level, which means even if you had something that it was x to the 2.6 power, which is weird, the derivative is going to have involved in it x to the if it was 2.6, the derivative will have x to the 1.6. Now, that doesn't complete our story. It just tells us a piece of the story, okay? Notice that I had a 4 up here. Now it's negative 4. Hmm. That's a little interesting, isn't it? So we'll, we'll talk more about that. But let's answer just a couple of questions. So A... I already figured it out. That was G prime was this. B, when will the slope be negative? Um, oh, let's do something simple. When would the slope be something like um, negative 16? Okay. In other words, g prime of x equals negative 16. Can we find out when that slope of that curve is precisely negative 16? Hmm. So hmm. there's the derivative. That's my slope equation. So what would you guys want to do if you were asked to go solve that? I would certainly get rid of that fraction. So let's do that. Okay, what would you want to do next if you were if that was your task to do that? Or maybe divide both sides by negative 16, right? Now, something is going to crop its ugly little head right on this next step because to solve that, the optimal solution would be to take the square root of both sides, is it not? Uh-oh, what happens every time we take the square root of both sides? little plus or minus. So when I take the square root of one side, I get x minus three. On the other side, I'm flipping it around. I got plus a half or minus a half, which is interesting. So what is that telling me? That there's not just one place on this curve with a slope of negative 16. There are two of them. Hmm. So if I added three to both sides, Three and one half would be one of the solutions, and I believe it would be if I subtracted three. I added three, I'd get this. Um, add three, uh, two and a half is the other one. Did I do that right? Um, but there's something else just that, that kind of just crops up about this Mr. problem. Reiner. It's a little bit interesting. Yes. Real quick, would you accept further, would you accept the notation of three plus or minus one half? Um, yeah, basically, yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, you know what? What's a little bit interesting, does anything jump out at you about this problem? If I said, hey, where is the graph horizontal? Where does it have a max? Like, where does it ever just pan out and become horizontal? Is the slope ever zero? When can a fraction ever be equal to zero? When the top is zero, what's the top? Yeah, so it can't be zero. Okay, so this thing is never horizontal, which means, by the way, there's no max or mins in this thing. Can't have one. Max and mins always have a slope of zero. We'll learn more about that later. But something else is interesting. The denominator will always be positive, won't it? What's the numerator? So what does that tell you about this curve? Is it no matter where I am on this curve, what am I going? This is a monotonic. That's a nice fancy little word for you. What does mono mean? One, monotonic, single behavior, monotonic, decreasing function. It's everywhere going downhill, okay? You guys all right so far? Little idea? 
Okay, one more, one more. And that comes to this thing right here. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Let's take a look at the irrational function. Okay, now, interestingly enough, and again, I'm not going to give you all of the bells and whistles here. So please understand, I'm going to give you some of it. Ooh, I should not use H, because I use the limit as H goes to zero. That's going to confuse. I'll go J. Let's go J of X is the square root of 2X minus 5. Or it could be plus 5, or it could be anything at all. I could honestly do any equation. It's going to be fine, which, by the way, is equivalent to saying this. Hmm. So guys, I see an exponent of positive one half. So if I have done this right, somehow in my work, when I am all said and done, what do you guys think my new exponent will be? Negative one. Well, one half is a square root, right? So what is a negative one half? A square root in the bottom? It's a square root in the bottom. So somehow, if I have done this problem correctly, I'm going to get a square root in the bottom. Oh, and by the way, you guys in this room better know this. I'm going to be super duper sad if you don't. But this looks like this, doesn't it? This is what the original graph looks like, right? So tell me about the slope. It's always increasing, isn't it? Now, in fact, not only is it always increasing, what's interesting is increasing at a decreasing rate. Chew on that for a minute. As you move to the right, what is happening to the slope? It's getting less and less steep. So if I look at my derivative, what I should find is three things. Number one, it should have an exponent of negative one half. Number two, the answer should always be positive, correct? And number three, as x gets bigger, the slope should get smaller, but stay positive, right? Staying positive, but smaller. Weird. Okay, we'll see. So here we go. Limit as h goes to zero. Now, could we actually put the limit on afterwards if we wanted to? We could do it without the, that, but, but, but I'm going to go ahead and just try to do it in one big, ugly story. Okay, that was fun. And now, what's the fix when somebody hands me an obnoxious problem with a radical like I did to you on the take home portion of the test? After you finish cursing your instructor, what do you multiply by? Conjugate. The conjugate. Now, in this case, this one was obvious. There's only one conjugate to take. So we're going to do root um, 2x plus h minus 5 and a plus root 2x minus 5 on the top. And I'm sorry, but I do get a little bit lazy. I put ditto marks underneath there because you know I'm going to write the same thing twice. And my chances of that writing being legible decreases the more I write it. And I know that about myself. I get lazy. So the whole point of that little maneuver right there, that little bit of mathematical trickery, why did we do that? What was the deal about the conjugate that made life so much better? Because this times this, basically what happens? The root goes away, and I just have this 2x plus h minus 5 dude, right? which I'm gonna put a big parentheses around that, okay? Just to make sure I don't screw something up. And then what happens when I do our outside and inside, those, those, those ladder and middle pieces? They cancel, so we're not even gonna to bother to write them down because that would be stupid. We did that on purpose. And then what happens when we pop in this last chunk right here is we're gonna lose all of this 2x minus five guy, right? And in the denominator, we have h times, well, ugliness. Oh, how terrible. In some ways, I think these are nicer than the one of the fractions, but I don't know. Anything good? Do you see anything that makes you smile? 
the negative five here would cancel with the positive five there. I'm with you. I see a positive two X here, canceling a negative two X over here. Do you guys see that okay? So what's really the only thing left on the numerator? 2H, don't forget that two. That two is actually important. You're gonna learn a lot about that two later. So the limit as H goes to zero, I have 2H left on top, and I have H on the bottom, and I have all of this, well, stuff. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna write stuff because I'm tired of writing the same thing over. Okay. Now, we can cancel our H's out because we are going to promise, we're gonna pinky swear that we won't literally let H be zero. We're just gonna play the game and we're not gonna to touch our sister. We're just gonna put our finger one one billionth of an inch from her face. Okay, so maybe that violates quantum mechanics, but whatever. We'll do it anyway. Math doesn't have to play by their rules. Okay, moving on. So as we get closer and closer to zero, what's going to happen is the numerator is just going to stay the number two, isn't it? Because it canceled out. Be really cautious about this. As H gets close to zero, what is, oh, I messed up. Nobody told me. There was a minus five here in that original. I just copied it wrong, which is one of my fears. There was a minus five there. Somebody probably saw and just didn't tell me. Okay, moving on. So see, as H goes to zero, isn't this thing two X minus five? What's this one? It's another root. So what happens if I take a root two X minus five and another root two X minus five? I have, I have two of those two X minus fives. So I actually just have a derivative of this right here, this is J prime of X. Huh, interesting. Do you guys notice anything? I have a square root, which is a one half power, but it's in the bottom making it negative. Huh. Now, true or false? For any value X that I plug in, in the domain, this will lead to a positive answer. Huh? So the slope is always positive. What happens as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger? Isn't the root gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger too? But you're dividing by a number that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What's that going to do to your answer? Is it's gonna make it smaller and smaller and smaller. So we actually do have that and it actually does work. So maybe just for fun, let's find the tangent line at, and I'm not gonna go fairly benign here. Let's try to make a number that is actually kind of kind. Um, well, what would be a nice number if I could make it say, let's see. Yeah, um, I think I want to go, somebody was saying three. I like three and that's kind of where, I guess I will. I was going to go with three originally, but it, but it did something that the previous problem did. And I don't want anybody to believe that it's always that. Okay, so let's go find the point on the curve. So what is the point on the original curve? Guys, what would happen if I plug three into my original story? I got one, don't I? So my point is three, one. So I could come in here and I could do y minus one. I could put an x minus three. This is the part I was kind of like, dang it, I just bad coincidence here. What's the slope at three? Well, it's also one. That was a bummer. F prime, or I should say J prime of three is also one because six minus five is one. Okay, well, let's see what happens then. Let's see if we did okay. Let's go ahead and tell this thing to do a quick new share. And let's see if we look at Desmos and find out what happens. So here comes our story. We had the square root, right? Of 2x minus five. Let's see, where did she go? 
where's my line? Where's my curve? Oh, I guess I just zoomed in a lot, didn't I, before? And I had some coordinate on the curve, which was 3 comma 1. And you just found that if we made x equal 3 right here, and y to be 1 right there, what should I happen as soon as I put that 1 is what should happen? It should snap right to that point, and they should match up perfectly. Is that pretty good? So if I zoomed in, what would appear to be true of both blue and red as we look at them is they would look to be like identical, like fused and perfectly matching at that moment. Does that make sense, everybody? So those are the three versions that I would like you guys to be familiar with is I would like you guys to be able to know how to find the slope of a polynomial. That one was probably the hardest in some ways. The rational equation, which involves a fraction buster. And what was the last one? The radical equation, which involved the good old friend, the conjugate. So what we are going to do today for the next little bit is we're going to actually try a new activity for you because I gave you a little bit of a hint here by doing what I have been doing. You see that? Oops, you can't see that at all. Let me go reshare screen that. See, I gave you a hint right here. See that one half? Did we get that negative one half? We saw the negative one here, negative two. And we saw these numbers also dropping. So last year, guys, we had ax to the k as what is called a power function. So I'm going to extend this a little bit beyond what happened. You may vaguely remember we had a question that had a windmill and I was saying that somehow like the power that came out of that windmill was very, you know, directly as the square of the wind. Some of you may remember that problem. I think they also had one about a guinea pig and its fur. Anyway, we had this bunch of questions that did this and what makes this a power function is it goes like this and a polynomial, that exponent has to be kind. It has to be like zero, one, two, three, four, nice pretty values. Yeah, not anymore. K can be anything I jolly well want it to be. So a polynomial is a power function. Every polynomial has exponents that are real, but they're nicer than that. This is just saying, hey, you know, although it worked really nice for polynomials, it works for everything. So whether it's nice or not nice, as long as you can write it as a power function, life is going to be good, which brings us to the following. This should not be an activity that takes very long, but you're going to get something that looks like this. You see this top left edge? That is a power function. Do you see it? That is ax to the k. And then another ax to the k over here. That is a power function. Cool? You see that guy? That is not a power function. You would want to multiply it out. And as you go through this document, there are, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven by fours. There's 28 of them. There's partners. I want you to figure out which two things go together. One is expressed correctly as a power function. One is expressed slightly differently. You know, what might somebody else have said on this one is you might have said 2 over x cubed plus 1 over x squared. That's not the way we express a power function. A power function should look like ax to the k. So guys online, that is there for you as well. It, it, is, uh, it is available. And I'm going to go ahead and pause the, uh, the lecture really? here. Really quickly. Yeah, Jen, go ahead. Are 4 and 11 a pair? Are 4 and 11 a pair? Yes, they are. Okay. 4 and 11 are a pair. So this is kind of the rest of our journey is right here. Now, this guy is just known as the power rule. So I, I, I need us to just make a little forward progress. My apologies. Block schedule being what it is. 
I, I don't want to have to be racing too fast later because I already have a propensity to go fast. So the last seven minutes is not a lot of time, but I'm going to try to use what I have. Okay, so the power rule, I think some of you have maybe figured out what it is. I kind of gave a little bit of a, of, a, of a hint up here on the board earlier that if you have something like 5x cubed, as it turns out, if this is your problem, f of x, then f prime is going to be 15x squared. If my original problem was, let's say, um, 8x to the sixth, then g prime, my derivative is going to be 48x to the fifth. So again, by just an educated guess, any ideas how 5x cubed would become 15? Now, I tried to make them numbers that were fairly obvious, like what I'm doing. Where the heck did 15 come from? Multiply the original exponent and the original coefficient. Is that what I did here to get the number 48? And then what happened to our exponent of our final answer? It dropped by how much? Exactly one every single time. So this is called the power rule, everybody. This is called the power rule. This is ax to the k, right? That's what I was telling you you would have. So what is f prime of ax to the n would be a times n. Remember, you take the product of the original coefficient and the original exponent. And then what do we do to the exponent? n minus 1. And that's literally all there is to it. Now we can take it a little step further and sometimes someone does something like this where say g of x is x to the n, let's actually call it a x to the n plus b x to the m. Now a nice thing about the fact that this is all coming from properties of limits and we talked about that, if I wanted to do this whole thing together I could do it in pieces. So that would mean the derivative of g would be n times a x to the n minus 1. Again, same rule we said, multiply and then reduce by 1. And what would be the other part? Same thing, but I can have a plus what? The product of these two, so m times b, and then it's going to be x to the m minus 1, meaning, oh my word, my brother told me how to do this when my teacher did not want me to know that. So I did every problem right on my first calculus test, every one right, and my teacher gave me an F on my test with a big smile on his face. He said, oh, thought you could trick me, did you, huh? You don't think I know that trick? So he didn't want me to use the fast way. He wanted to do the other way because can you guys help me with my derivative? What is it? What does it start with? 36x to the second. Boy, was that a lot nicer than that other thing we did with the h's? What's the next piece? Minus 8x. Uh-uh. We're not done. Plus 7. Oh, because what's the exponent here? It's a 1, so 1 times 7 is 7. And if I draw my exponent, it's now x to the 0. But what is anything to the 0 power? 1. Okay. Not quite done. Number 2. How about if we went ahead and went with g of x is equal to x cubed over 5 minus 2x? We're gonna kind of just keep getting a little bit harder because the power rule is a very, very um, powerful little thing. So that would be g prime. This is the right notation that we would use, okay? That's the answer to the derivative. What would it be? My leading coefficient is 1 fifth, so what happens when I multiply down? I just get 3 fifths. And what's the next little piece? Minus 2. No big deal. Number 3. We're getting there. How about 5 
x to the 3 fifths minus x to the 1 half. Now please understand, these are roots, aren't they? Something to the 3 fifths power. I should be doing all sorts of uh, conjugates and all this kind of mess to make things better, but the power rule says, nah, what is 3 fifths times 5? 3. And if I take away 1 from the exponents, 3 fifths take away 1 is negative 2 fifths. Oh, drop that exponent down, multiply it by 1. A half times 1 is still a half. And that would be x to the what power? It was already 1, so if I drop 1, that would be negative 1 half, which means someone could have said equivalently that this is the answer. Now this is playing a little bit with what you were doing in that little matching game, if you will. Just follow me. That's playing a little bit with that matching game that I gave you just a moment ago. Now, the, the what I just gave out to you, because I am out of time, the bell is going to ring any second now, but um, what's called the fast way, try to do about the first six or eight of them the fast way. You can't go probably beyond there because I didn't, I didn't go far enough today. I didn't have enough time, but I wanted to get started on it to help tomorrow be a little bit better because tomorrow is a very short day, right? All right, so hopefully that was okay. So make sure you get your homework in um, as soon as you can. I hope I got everybody's take home tests. We will see you all again tomorrow.